All right, we're going to pick up here uh, just at the end of chapter 15 before we get into 16. A topic here, this is kind of a, uh, kind of a sidebar, if you please, but I thought this was a good place to teach a lesson that would be very helpful uh, to all of us from uh, ex- uh, the end of the chapter. Conflict resolution. I'm on page 191 in our notebook. I'm going to begin reading in Acts chapter 15, verse number 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. And Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was only by pride cometh contention. That's what the book of Proverbs says. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder. In other words, they split. They split up, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, who was introduced to us not long ago, and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So this was part of the ministry of these apostles. They were traveling evangelists, missionaries, disciplers. They didn't stay in one place for, any, for years, let's put it that way. Maybe three years was the longest that Paul stayed anywhere. But beyond that, he, uh, he did a lot of traveling. He traveled literally thousands of miles. We think of missionaries today, a missionary uh, makes a decision to go to a particular country, maybe they go to a, uh, an African country like the country of Zambia. So they go there and they make a commitment to go there. Maybe after two or three years, God has been working in that missionary, his family, their lives, and they decide that they're going to go to another country. They're gonna to go to the country of Malawi, which isn't very far away, and oftentimes, pastors and churches will cut their support of that individual because they changed fields. Well, that isn't biblical. Paul, if Paul was a missionary, and I believe he was, a sent one, if Paul was a missionary, Paul changed fields often. Frequently he changed fields. Does that mean that Paul should not have had prayer or financial support? I think not. So um, not that we should support people who can't figure out where they're supposed to be uh, in, in life. Uh, we shouldn't support people who every maybe three or four weeks decide they're going to go to another country and spend another $25,000 getting there. That's kind of impractical, is it not? But at the same time, to judge a missionary and say he's out of God's will or not worthy of support because he and his family change fields, they go from one country to another, Frankly, God doesn't draw lines in borders between countries like we do. He hasn't done that. In fact, the lines that men draw change from time to time, do they not? So we've read through uh, verse uh, number 41 in this chapter, and there's a, there's a conflict between uh, these two great men of God, Paul and Barnabas. It was Barnabas that introduced Paul to the disciples way, way back uh, in the earlier chapters of the book. Paul certainly had to be uh, very thankful uh, and grateful for the work and friendship that Barnabas showed him many years before. But now time has gone by. We're probably 15 years or so uh, into their relationship, and John Mark is a relative of Barnabas, and Barnabas is probably trying to, maybe he realizes that John Mark has got some issues, some problems, but he's trying to be graceful and bring him along and, and bring him back into the ministry. Paul is upset. Whatever the reason was that John Mark left, Paul wasn't happy with it. The contention was sharp. That's the word the King James Bible uses in verse number 39. In the last verses of chapter 15, we see that uh, that these two men, Paul and Barnabas, who command such great respect for their dedication and accomplishments in the faith, have a sharp disagreement 
at least temporarily, and at least temporarily severs their relationship. Could it be possible? Could it be possible that two spirit-filled, committed individuals failed to find common ground and the wherewithal to resolve their own conflict? On this occasion, could it be even Paul and Barnabas were human and had transformational work to do as we see? So we've quoted for you in the text, Proverbs 13.10, only by pride cometh contention. And that is the word that is used in your King James Bible in verse 39. So we know that there's some pride. When people have a disagreement with one another, uh, at least one of the two people are being prideful about the situation. I like Romans 12, 18. It says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And that doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It says live peaceably. So you can disagree. Paul and Barnabas could disagree. But they ought to part peaceably or amicably with one another. In this particular situation, they did not. So this, uh, this led me to think about this uh, issue of conflict re resolution when I originally went through this study. And um, some years ago... I read a book by Ken Sandy uh, called The Peacemaker. I highly recommend this book. It's a great book. And uh, it's not uncommon for, uh, in marriages particularly, for husbands and wives to be at odds with one another. And, of course, pride being at the center issue of that, and I believe it always is at the center of the, the issue of uh, uh, marital disagreements with one another that um, many times I've had to counsel, sit down and listen to uh, a couple, listen to their disagreements and try to be a negotiator, a mediator, and I've recommended this particular book many times. More often than not, I have got a very positive reaction from the people who have read these. Sometimes when you recommend to people what they need to do to resolve their differences. Some people just, they don't have the, they don't have the willingness uh, to do that. They, they don't read the book. They don't pay attention to what the book says. They're not going to do it. Oftentimes people, when they came to me for marriage counseling, they pretty much had already made up their mind. They were making a token appearance in my office so they could tell their friends that they really tried to resolve. We went to Pastor Grace, but, you know, that didn't work either. Well, it's not up to me to fix them. Uh, it's up to those two people to fix their relationship and resolve their conflict. And there's some rules to be able to do that. Here at the bottom of uh, page 191, we read that Sandy writes, whenever you are involved in a conflict, you may apply four basic principles of peacemaking by asking yourself these questions. Number one, how can I please and honor the Lord in this situation? Oftentimes when people are at odds with one another, this is the last thing on their list or the furthest thing from their mind. They're not considering their Christianity, their testimony, the relationship with Christ and what the right thing to do uh, is uh, for them as a Christian. How have I contributed to this conflict and what do I need to do? Well, you can see if you've ever had a conflict with anyone, it's really easy to point out how the other individual is wrong and give yourself a pass on maybe what you have done wrong yourself. We're, that's human nature. That's the way we are. You need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of the fact that that other individual doesn't give you a free pass like you have given yourself. Number three, how can I help others understand how they have contributed to this conflict? Boy, that's a touchy subject right there. Well, my wife's name is Penny. Penny, let me tell you how you have contributed to this conflict. <laughs> I've been there before. That doesn't work really well for me. Now, that's because my wife and I are human and sinners. 
Now, that could be done lovingly and gracefully if you're willing to listen to the other person share with you how they view your behavior or what you have done wrong to bring about this conflict. The fourth thing is, how can I demonstrate forgiveness and encourage a reasonable solution to this conflict? How can we resolve this conflict? I'm going to guess, uh, and just historically, uh, from the many experiences that I've had in dealing with people in marital conflict, relational conflict, that oftentimes uh, finances or money is at the center. Someone said that half of the disagreements or arguments that married people have are over the use of money. You know, where is it going to come from? What's it going to be spent on? How much do we have? Why doesn't the other person control himself or herself or whatever it is? And when you talk about money, there's a lot of things, many things you can complain about and uh, find fault with, no doubt. So how do, you, how do you mediate or how do you bring to some reasonable conclusion those kinds of situations? I think the first thing you have to realize is Proverbs 13.10, that only by pride cometh contention, that your pride, uh, certainly your pride, maybe the other person's pride, but your pride, you can't judge them, you can judge yourself though, that your pride is at the center of this controversy. You want to make the decisions and you want to have control over the conclusion of this conversation. And more importantly, you want to have control over the money, the decision about the money, using that as an illustration. So, uh, but we need to find some kind of reasonable, uh, negotiable uh, uh, solution to the difficulty that we have we need to find something reasonable. This is simple. This is simple. This is not a big problem. I am, uh, I, I spend a lot of time with people as a pastor, a lot of time conversing with people, teaching people, sitting in my office counseling people. Many years ago, my wife, uh, we have five children, in raising five children, her responsibility, primarily as a responsible, uh, as a responsible stay-at-home mom, she, her major um, relationships or primary relationships were with her children and spending time with them in training and raising them. So whenever we went on vacation, we both had a different idea of what a vacation was. My wife is a, uh, is a traveler. She, is a, she, she, is a, she likes to go to the museum. She likes to uh, uh, experience things that... Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the experience of a boat ride or a cruise or a, uh, going to a place that's a famous place. She's a tourist. Let's put it that way. She's a tourist. I'm not a tourist. I'm not, I, I don't care that much about going someplace to be busy for five or six days to go look at everything and experience the culture and uh, the people, and the important places. It's a, I don't care about that. That's me. That's me. It's not right or wrong. It's just me. So when we would go on vacation, my idea is find a swimming pool, a nice tall glass of lemonade, and uh, some sun, 85 degrees, and sit down and read a book and relax. Now, my wife would like to be a turisto. She'd like to go see things. So we had to come to, after we you know, butted heads about this, over a couple vacations many years ago, we decided that if we went on vacation, we would split the time and do both. And we would decide beforehand how we would do that. So let's say, for sake of numbers, we'd have 10 days uh, on vacation. We would spend five days doing what I wanted to do, and we'd spend five days doing what she wanted to do, and we would never complain about doing what the other person wanted to do. So if my wife wanted to go to... Uh, uh, to, to Disney World, okay? She wants to go to Disney World and see everything at Disney World. That's not my favorite thing to do that, to walk around and stand in line for an hour to get on a ride. Now, I've done it several times, but it's not my favorite thing. I'd rather be at the swimming pool with a glass of lemonade, with a book. I really would. 
but we're going to Disney World and we're going to go to, uh, you know, Splash Gardens and whatever it is, we're going to do that. We're going to see the things that my wife wants to see and experience. Five days. But then we're going to take five days and we're just going to uh, sleep in, get up and go to breakfast, hang out at the pool, go to an early bird dinner at 4.30, uh, watch some television, watch the sunset, go for a walk on the beach, whatever it is. For me, that's a vacation for me. Two different ideas. So what we did is we negotiated. We sat down and we came up with a, a plan that both of us would get something of what we wanted, but neither of us would get everything we wanted. You can't do that when you have another person involved. I've used that illustration countless times over the years. It's a simple thing. It's probably a lot easier to come to some kind of reasonable um, uh, solution when it's over vacation things than many other things that take place in marital relationships. The raising of children, monetary things, work responsibilities, all of those things, those can bring about some serious conflicts uh, between the two individuals. I understand that. But you have to be willing to listen to the other person, sit down, and negotiate. You've got to be willing to do that and try to split this thing evenly. And you know what? There's nothing wrong. <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't hear me say this, but there's nothing wrong giving a little towards the other individual. What if we did six days what my wife wanted and four days what I wanted? That might show my wife that I really cared about her. By the way, it could go the other way too. And I know my wife. When I show my wife that I'm trying to please her, it opens the door for her to want to please me. It's just been our relationship. We've been married for over 50 years now and I know her fairly well. So anyway, we've got the history on page 192 of John Mark where he shows up. What is the, what is the, uh, the disagreement about? Paul didn't want John Mark to go. Barnabas did. They had a sharp disagreement over that. They parted. How do you resolve that? So we've given you some related scriptures at the bottom of 192 to Paul, Barnabas, and to John Mark. We also gave you an outline from a book that I read many years. I read this book in one sitting. It was so good when I read it. it the, the book entitled by Charles Swindoll, How to uh, uh, Strike the Original Match, in chapter 7 particularly deals with, uh, I think it's seven principles on how to have a good fight. Excellent chapter in that book. If you can ever get a hold, hold of that book, it's worth reading. As I said, I haven't read very many books in my life in one sitting, but that is one of them. Now, as you go uh, in through page 193, you can see the peacemaker paradigm. I just kind of spelled it out quickly at the top of page 192, but this is a little bit more uh, in detail of what Sandy's paradigm is for conflict resolution. The first thing we need to do is we need to be willing to glorify God in our disagreements. And uh, uh, there's a question that's asked there. How can I please and honor God in this situation? Conflict affords us the opportunity to be Christ-like toward the person we're having conflict with. We need to live in peace. As much as lieth within you, we need to seek peace, a peaceful solution to our disagreement. And we need to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all thy ways, even in conflict resolution. Acknowledge him <clears throat> and he will direct your paths. Then, number two, 194. Get the log out of your own eye. Remember, you're a problem to the other individual. You have a problem. That person who disagrees with you is your big obstacle right now. Well, you happen to be their big obstacle. So you need to ask the question, how have I contributed to this conflict and what do I need to do about it? Is this really worth fighting over? Some of the disagreements that my wife and I had, uh, and I've told this story publicly many times, we were engaged to be married and we were sitting in a restaurant one night and we were having a meal and we were talking things over Long story short, my mother 
used to vacuum the blinds. So I made comment that when we got married, that Penny, my wife, would vacuum the blinds. Well, my wife responded when I made that suggestion with, no, I won't. And what ensued was one of the biggest arguments that we ever had in our life. We laugh about it now, but it was no laughing matter. We called our wedding off over that. My wife gave me her engagement ring back over whether or not she would vacuum the blinds. Now, that was her pr problem. My problem was because my mother did. You don't ever t compare your wife to your mother in a, in a way that you denigrate your wife. You don't say, oh, my mother was a good cook. You stink. Don't do that. You already know that. I know that. But let me just give you some advice that's free. Don't do that. Don't compare your family with other family members in a negative way or other people's family members in a negative way, particularly your husband, particularly your wife. We do not respond well. Gently, number three in the middle of 194, gently restore. How can I lovingly serve others, question, by helping them take responsibility for their contribution to this conflict? It ought to be just between... You don't talk to your friends about your marital disagreements, like I did already. Of course, they were a long time ago. We speak the truth in love. That's a great verse, Ephesians 4.15. Take one or two others along, if need be. Now, we're talking about conflict resolution, not between husbands and wives. I wouldn't bring two or three witnesses in and say, Honey, I brought uh, Uncle Tony, Aunt Louise, and uh, your nephew to witness this disagreement, to show them how incorrigible you are. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. So this, is, uh, this applies in other situations for sure. Go and be reconciled. How can I demonstrate the forgiveness of God and encourage a reasonable solution to this conflict? And, and that's what we need to do. That, uh, the other three things certainly precede it. But the bottom line is, how can I show forgiveness? How can I show grace? How can I show kindness? How can I be Christ-like and bring about or encourage a reasonable solution to our disagreement? At the bottom, of, or halfway down, 195, you see the Peacemaker's Pledge. A lot of good stuff in there. And um, over, we've finished this lesson on uh, page 196 with these thoughts. By God's grace, we will apply these principles as a matter of stewardship, realizing that conflict is an opportunity, not an accident. We will remember that success in God's eyes is not a matter of specific results, but of faithful, dependent obedience. Faithful, dependent obedience. And we will pray that our service as peacemakers will bring praise to our Lord and lead others to know his infinite love. Contention is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It has to do with our relationship with God. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto god and the peace of god that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through christ jesus that's philippians chapter 4 6 and 7 that has to be one of the best most valuable most important passages of scripture in all the bible we all worry some more than others, some to a greater extreme than others. But we need not to worry. We have an advocate. We have a high priest. We have a big brother. He's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wants us. 
when we find ourselves in trouble, He wants us to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. We need to go to Him. And Hebrews 4, 16 and Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7 certainly are passages that go hand in hand with one another. Again, be careful. Don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, that means everything, by prayer, we ought to go to the Lord in prayer, particularly about these difficult situations, contention, um, irresolved conflicts. We need to go to the Lord in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Thank God that this is the only problem that you're dealing with. You could be dealing with much more serious problems, could you not? With thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Talk to Him about your problem. Talk to Him as a friend, as a counselor, as someone who is wise and really cares about you. So, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the result of that, verse 7, is the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You'll be at peace through the difficult times, the difficult decisions, the contentious conversations, the disagreements that we might have with people that we claim that we love the most. Never let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let that happen. Contention is a heart issue. Contention is a pride issue. We are to make our best effort in resolving our relationships with others. Are we willing to do that? And the Bible says that blessed are the peacemakers. We are also called, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we as Christian people are called ministers of reconciliation, meaning simply this, that we're bringing two opposing parties together. When we evangelize, when we're fishers of men, we are bringing God and a lost individual together. Now, God doesn't have to move. He's already moved. What we're, but we're bringing lost people into an understanding of who God is, who they are, what God has done, and what they need to do, and bringing them together to make peace between God and another human individual, a place where each of us ought to dwell every day of our lives. We are, as Christian people, we are ministers of reconciliation. So let's take a break before we get into chapter number 16 here. Some great things in this chapter as we continue uh, Paul's uh, missionary journeys. <laughs> 